All right, in this video, I'm going to help you to feel, to create a mechanical alert model based on an example, and then to solve a problem with a PKN fracture. Let's start with problem 765, which is creating a mechanical earth model or stress law. If you click on this link, I'm going to click, and you will be redirected redirected to GitHub. In GitHub, you're going to find this uh, Excel file that you can download by clicking here. And also, if you'd like to work with this on Python or with some other uh, software, you have also the data as a text uh, delimited file. So you download each of these and you will find this file in which we have uh, six columns which uh, come from a real field, I believe is somewhere near California. So we have the columns of depth, reservoir pressure, which is going to be pore pressure, density, mass density, compressional wave slowness, and shear wave slowness. And we also have uh, porosity. So what we're going to do here is in order to complete this problem is we're going to follow the procedure which is laid out in this example over here. So if you go to section 734, you will find this workflow. All right, so the first thing is going to be to use the bulk density in order to compute vertical stress. So let's do that uh, with vertical stress and with pore pressure, we're gonna be able to fulfill problem number one. All right, so I already wrote a little bit on this file. All of this is something that you're gonna have to write on your own. Let me change colors just to make sure that all of this is new. You're not gonna find this in your file. You're just going to find what is in black. This is all the data. And the first thing that you have to do is to compute the total vertical stress. For this case, I'm a asking you to assume that the rock above this particular depth, which is 1750 feet, everything has this same mass density. Therefore, our vertical stress is going to be equal to the lithostatic gradient, one PSI per feet that we're going to uh, scale it to the mass density of this particular rock. So we know that one PSI per foot, that's for a rock which is 2.3 grams per centimeter cube. So if I have a rock which is lighter than that, I'm going to have to do the proper scaling. So that's gonna take care of the scaling and that times depth. And I should get a stress, which is around 1400 PSI. Okay, now that I have the vertical stress, the next step is going to be to compute the effective vertical stress. Here you have pore pressure, so simply the effective vertical stress is going to be the total vertical stress minus the pore pressure, and now we have effective vertical stress. And that's going to be in PSI. Okay, so here is what, what I recommend. You can do it differently, but this is what I recommend. You should work in order to calculate the horizontal stresses in the SI system. That's going to be easier. So we're going to convert now this vertical effective stress to Pascal's one PSI is uh, equal to, well, let, let me put it in other terms, which is, uh, uh, which are, I remember, uh, one MPA, one megapascal is 145 PSI. So in order to convert this to megapascals, I need to divide this by 145. In order to convert it to pascals, I need to multiply 
times 1 million and that's 1 million so the amount of pascals I have is is that it's uh, about 5 million pascals so which is 5 mega pascals all right now I have effective vertical stress the next step is going to be to compute the horizontal stresses and in order to do that I I have to use and I have to compute the stiffness of the rock the stiffness of the rock is going to depend on the velocities so what I recommend that you do first is first you compute what is the P wave velocity of the rock and you convert this to meters per second and here you have the equation this is going to be the inverse of the slowness and convert a feet to a meter so one one foot is 0 0.305 meters and one microsecond is one to take to the minus six seconds so those are those two numbers and that should give you velocities which are in the order of a thousandth or a little bit smaller for example for the shear wave this is the p wave is the same thing same conversion for the shear wave and now we have the velocities in meters per second once you have these velocities you're going to be able to compute what is the Poisson ratio the Poisson ratio we have it here in this equation is going to be given by this formula which I'm not going to type right now it's going to be your job but you can type the equation of the dynamic Poisson ratio and that's going to give you this result in this cell over here also with the data that we already have since we have BP we have VS and we have mass density you can calculate what is the dynamic EM modulus and here's the equation for the dynamic EM modulus again you have some BP VS squared and something very important is that you have to multiply this times bulk density in order to make this multiplication remember to multiply the value in grams per centimeter cube times a thousand for example 1.87 grams per centimeter cube is equivalent to 1870 kilograms per meter cube and that's what you have to use okay so when you calculate the dynamic ion modulus remember to multiply the density in grams per centimeter cube to a for a thousand so that you convert that to the SI system once you have got to that point you're going to be able to calculate the static EM modulus and that's going to be simply the multiplication of the dynamic EM modulus times the coefficient FDS which in this particular problem I'm telling you that is 0.75 so coming back over here this is point, uh, 0.65 and this is going to be your result so this is going to be some value which is not going to be zero okay and after you have that then you're going to be able to compute knowing what is your tectonic strain which is given in this problem you have the two tectonic strains over here you're going to be able to compute sigma h min and sigma h max with these two equations you have the Poisson ratio ready you have sigma v you have the plane strain modulus the static here uh, oh, i'm missing one uh, column over here don't forget to compute the plane strain modulus static which is equal to the yam modulus divided uh, one minus the square of the Poisson ratio so we have that value we have Poisson ratio we have epsilon h max which is a tectonic strain which is over here and the other one is going to be zero so just forget about this other term you're just going to use the second one and the first one and after you have that you'll be able to calculate sigma h mean and sigma h max and after you have those two now we can come back and calculate what the, are the total stresses sh mean and sh max by adding the pore pressure and at that point 
you can come back to uh, the PSI and field units. That's going to be it's going to be much easier to convert pascals to PSI and do the conversion for especially for the velocities and for the densities that there it gets quite complicated. All right, so you can do that for the first row. So what do you do for the following rows, which is all the data as a function of depth? Well, you should, for vertical total stress, you know what to do. You have to add now the additional weight of the new layer here, separated by five feet, so you can compute that additional total vertical stress. With that additional total vertical stress, you have the new effective vertical stress and you're going to have now your velocities that are going to vary with depth, your pore pressure, which is going to vary with depth, and also your vertical stress, which is going to vary with depth. In this simplified model, what we are assuming is that the entire package of the sediment, that means all these rows, have the same tectonic strain. So we apply the same equation, and we apply the same tectonic strain to all of those. And once we do that, you will be able to calculate sigma h min and sigma h max. And later, sh min and sh max. And this is going to be the final result. And what you are going to get is something similar to what you see over here with vertical stress that should increase with depth and should be more or less a line. It's not going to be exactly a straight line, but it's going to be close to that. And you're going to have your total horizontal stresses that are going to be close to the values of, uh, of stress. And what I mean close is in the same order of magnitude, right? Those could be higher, could be uh, smaller. It depends. Uh, but uh, make sure that uh, usually when you have a problem with the units, you will see that your, for example, SH max is 100 times bigger than SV. And that, that, of course, that doesn't make sense. Or SH mean is 20 times smaller than SV. That also doesn't make much sense. So uh, make sure that you get the right results and be very careful with the units here. And again, here, uh, you just have to repeat the same workflow for all the rows. And that's going to give you the variation of these stresses with depth. And after you do that, what you have to do is uh, a little bit of interpretation for hydraulic fracturing. So in this case, I'm asking you at the depths between 2,100 feet and 2,450 feet, if you were to happen perforations and if you were to happen to hydraulic, hydraulically fracture uh, those, uh, those depths at this particular depths, what will happen to that hydraulic fracture? Would that grow up? Would that grow down? Would that be contained, like for example in this case, would that be contained by uh, these peaks of high stress? Or probably, you know, sometimes you may start like at a high stress. If you start at a high stress, like something over, over here, probably your fracture may grow mostly in direction upwards, like those uh, Mickey Mouse head type fractures that uh, we saw in the simulation in the previous video. So with the information of the stress log and the variation of the stress with depth, you're going to be able to tell more or less how the hydraulic fracture is going to propagate even without running a hydraulic fracture simulation to start with. And that also in practice is going to help you define what are going to be, for example, your perforation depths to execute a hydraulic fracture treatment. All right, so that's uh, everything for uh, this problem. And uh, for this discussion, I encourage you again to, to watch the previous video and you will see an explanation of how to interpret this stress log. For the next problem, we have a PKN problem and I am asking you to compute fracture half length, fracture width and net pressure as a function of time. And Basically, uh, what you have to do here is just to use the PKN equations, which are over here. And uh, these are the PKN equations. You see that you have 
all the parameters that uh, affect fracture length, width, and net pressure. And these are a function of time. So your independent variable is going to be time, and your dependent variables are going to be xf, uh, w, the width, and the net pressure. And this is very similar to the problem that I have in, in this example problem 7.2. Here I have computed that for just a given time, which in this case is uh, 1800 seconds. But in the problem that you have to solve here uh, in problem 766, uh, you're going to have do, to do this for, for a fracture as a function of time. And probably you have, you're going to have to do this with either with Excel or with, uh, with Python or MATLAB or any other software uh, you want. Again, time is going to be your variable and you have to plot how the, these three other independent variables, they vary with time. Something to be careful about is that here I'm giving you the rate for the entire wellbore. So this is a two win rate, okay? In order to have the parameter i that goes into the equation of the PKN equation, remember that that parameter i is just for one wing. So just you have to do the math in order to calculate this parameter i. But you have all the other data uh, here. And so you should be able, you have fracture height, you have the plane strain, uh, modulus, viscosity. Uh, you should be able to calculate uh, all of these um, variables, again, as a function of time. And also, I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of a volumetric analysis and to compute what is the resulting uh, total volume of this fracture. And with this uh, total volume, uh, I'd like that you tell me how many swimming pools and sun tracks that hydraulic fracture treatment is equivalent to. And you may be surprised by this is going to be a relatively large number, but that, that's what you're going to have to compute. And uh, I was looking for this value. Remember that this is going to be hydraulic treatment that is going to last just one hour. So you have volumes, uh, you have rates, you have times, you can compute all of these numbers. Again, guide yourself with this example, problem 7.2. And similarly to the previous problem, I strongly recommend that you convert all your field units to SI units. And after you convert that to SI units, you convert it back to field units, as I do in this example, right? So the volumes should be meters squares, the time should be in second, pressures, and stresses should be in pascals, length in meters, and uh, and uh, and those those are all the units we need. So um, so that's uh, everything for this uh, problem, and uh, I'll see you in another video.